We've got people flowing in. Okay, I'll be right back myself. <laughs> One piece of paper here missing. There it is. Welcome everyone. We're so happy you're here. Thank you. Yumiko, readings from across the ocean. Hey. Hi, Cynthia. Hey there. <laughs> nice that you stayed up. I think you're staying up, right? It's the middle of the night for you. Uh, no, in the morning, seven o'clock in the morning. No problem in that case. <laughs> Good to see you. You don't want to be seen. Cynthia. Mm -hmm. <coughs> it's wonderful to look at all the people who are showing up and recognize what a community David convenes around himself, huh? Yes, absolutely. <laughs> Friends whom we all know from so many different contexts. Well, Lisa, my clock says it's time. It does. It does. All right. We, I am admitting folks here, um, but <clears throat> we, we shall begin. And um, I want to welcome you all today to this exciting event. It is an event we hope will reveal David Gershon's Wit and Wonder. And um, I think many of you know this impulse really arose uh, <laughs> kind of sent from the angels at 4.44 in the morning following a um, study group with the Central Regional Council where we were exploring the question of Parseval and what ails thee. And it, it, I was awakened with this urge to ask the community um, and share what, what ails me. And that was the need to express my appreciation and gratitude in some way for David. And David had um, invited me to assist him in uh, the early stages of the pandemic when he started holding online gatherings, Zoom gatherings, to help him with the technology. So I um, Seem to it seems the message came <laughs> to me in this way, and so today, what we have on our plan here is a fairly loose improvisational structure that um, goes a little bit with some opening beauty, and then we'll have a few comments, uh, speakers, and then we will start to sort of dance through um, through um, David's biography. And as we go through the biography, we'll share a little bit about what we know, but if there's anyone out there who knows about this particular phase of his biography, uh, we're going to invite you to, to share something. And uh, we're trying to keep those to about three minutes. And then as we get into the more present day, we will have an open uh, mic time where anybody who would like to contribute, share anything you'd like, um, then uh, we'll, we'll close with a, a beautiful community act of, uh, of grace with the hallelujah. So that is our plan. And with that, I'd like to turn it over to Cynthia and, um, and have Cynthia <clears throat> share with us uh, her thoughts. 
so much, Lisa. And once again, thank you on everyone's behalf for you having pulled this community event together. I now and at the end of the sharing today, we're going to share a verse, one of the several verses that Rudolf Steiner gave for our work with those who have crossed the threshold. And we chose this one, I chose this one really because I have such a strong feeling that David wasn't finished with his biography, that he, if I can presume to say so, I really have the feeling that this death visit him in the night and kind of took him by surprise. And someone asks if my volume can be increased. I'll see if I can do that. Audio settings. And they turn that my, no, my volume is on maximum. So see if you can do it at your end. Okay. And having this impression that David is not finished with his work, I have the impression he has left much for us to do, and he'll be happy to help us with it. And so I've chosen this verse. Faithfully, I or we will follow your soul through the gate of death. No, this is not the one for him. This was a different one for other friends. And my dear good friends and good people, that was one of the ones that says, I will warm your cold. That's not the one for David. I'll bring another one right now. And at the end of the time, I'll, I'll bring the one that speaks about, we'll work with you. But this one is also fine. You were ours and you will be ours as the light of the spirit now streams from your soul eyes filled with devotion. It will be your thoughts, noble power to seek in spirit worlds the love that faithfully we keep for you. Mm. Dear David, just for a couple of words of introduction, I met David back in the 80s, but we only started quite recently having a pretty intense relationship as I began doing a lot of work with patients with him. And I know him, as many of you do, as an incredibly engaged, lively thinker, very involved. And I have the feeling that the world really impressed him strongly in all kinds of ways. He, he took in the impressions of his patients strongly. That's the first place I experienced that. But also his impressions of food, of music. So many times when we talk on the phone, he would say, oh, I'm just in love with this music. Isn't this fabulous? I hope some of you have had that experience as well. Or sometimes he would call me on the phone and he'd say, Cynthia, darling, I have just made the most delicious crostata. The butter was perfect. Let me send you the recipe. You can make it just like I did. Well, actually, I only used three quarters of a cup of butter, and it said to use seven eighths, but I think three quarters. He was right into the details of that. And I remember then how much he loved the plants. And I remember the day when Harold, this one, Harold and I went to San Francisco and we called and said, David, we're going to the botanical garden. It's just down the street from you. Would you like to come? He said, in a minute. So he and Harold loved walking through the garden and looking at every single plant and kind of uh, in a friendly men's way, competing on who knows the species names better, <laughs> et cetera. But at the end of examining a plant, then, Har then David would take a little baggie out of his pocket and a little knife and very surreptitiously, he would say, sometimes I just can't resist taking a, um, taking a cutting from something. And he did. And he would take it home and he put it in a pot and he took us out in his backyard and showed us all these little things <laughs> that, he would, <laughs> that he would do. Yeah. We're going to start this um, sharing, as Lisa said, with a biographical study. And 
yet, and so before that, by way of introduction, I'm going to ask John Bloom to bring a contribution that he has prepared with a bit of an overview of David's whole life and how he has known him all of these years. And then we'll go back and start the clock running from his birth in, in um, Washington, DC. So John, will you take it please? Sure, can you hear me all right? Yes. Sure, I'm unmuted, great. Well, thank you and thank you for this opportunity and thank you for pulling the event together, uh, both of you. and. Um, for the time that we have together just to support David in, in his journey as well. So David Gershon was and is an epic poem, but one that seemed to come with an unresolved and unexpected end. He told his tale sometimes in fragments, images and memories, often in response to conversations about place or experience. Sometimes those conversations unfolded as continuous asides as if footnoted or cross-referenced to cultural events. That was really just part of his joy, his free association, even while you knew he was inwardly tapping into the font of his meditative life. Because those insights came as well. No epic is without its ponderous moments in which we're taken to the breath of humanity, light and dark. In his empathic descriptions of unnamed patients suffering homelessness, AIDS, developmental difficulties, he could come to tears. But then he would find himself by beginning a new sentence in third person about himself. The doctor must see the patient, be the patient. It was as if he were instructing himself in the fine art of pastoral medicine. Maybe he would throw in a quick reference to Rudolf Steiner's lectures or another aside. Pastoral medicine was an art he knew well, a practice in which his passion his compassion and will to serve others' illnesses and suffering could rise to supersensible deed. His healing work lifted up his patients' humanness so they could participate in their own healing. And this work could truly weigh and wear on him. But that's just the Dr. David part. There was also the activist Dr. David who would do his patient best to the cultivate community, consider building a website for it or convene his fellow anthroposophists for the sake of waking us up to the beautiful and brutal reality for which Anthroposophia can serve as guide. It certainly guided his devoted life. It was not always easy for, for him to be in anthroposophical community. Earlier, he was shunned because of his homosexuality, but that time has passed. He stood deeply in the freedom of spirit with a profound self-knowledge that supported his courageous inner strength. He stayed vulnerable and connected to the source of spirit knowledge such that he did not lose sight of the gifts of Rudolf Steiner's insights and their healing practicalities, despite others' personal biases. Through all this adversity, he emerged, he emerged as a vibrant presence in the regional medical community, beyond that also in many people's lives. And what he familiarly called the PAM, which is the Physicians Association for Anthroposophical Medicine, and the Council of Anthroposophical Organizations, where he was deeply loved. He knew that he was right and that old unfounded cultural attitudes would yield in his persistence and his capacity for loving relationship with everyone and through deep, deep collaboration as a healer. The conventional boundaries of disciplines were an artifice to him. He wanted to and did work with farmers and pharmacists, eurythmists, educators, therapists, the list is as long as his interests were wide. He was open to anyone with a question, a real inquiry into healing and ennobling the human being. He not only assiduously studied the anthroposophical remedies, he also actually had to engage with making them. He didn't just love music, he had to learn the cello to be with the genius of, of the composers he so dearly loved. This was his artistic creative nature and his capacity to discipline his will enough to make it through medical school, internships and residencies as a, as a late entry. He loved literature, he was an English major, so he understood the power of narrative and the epic itself. He loved language and thought and conversation and he loved cooking. It was his passion and vocation before doctoring. He could describe in detail the time spent perfecting brodos and the real work that stands behind making world-class food. It was an episodic stream in his journey. 
It was a practice of alchemy, really. Along the way of his telling these kitchen stories over dinner, hints and pieces of his biography would emerge about his father and their relationship, his exploits as an unsupervised young person, his possible path as an artist, and his discovery of self in reflections from the world. His epic poem began young and became ever more conscious through his life, always seeking, always doing, always moving deeper into caring until through healing himself, he could truly care for humanity in his heart and profession. He bore and served humanity's wounds, salvaged them through humor and sometimes in anguished expression. He stood for anthroposophical knowing and its contributions to science and medicine was amazingly present in his own quirky way for those that he had just met, those who knew him long, and those simply needing someone to see them. He was a mensch, a true and loyal companion to me and many people, and champion of the human spirit in his lifetime. David was living proof of Rudolf Steiner's statement that each individuality is a species unto themselves. He left no doubt about that. Neither did he leave doubt that working on the human soul was his healing mission. For me, it's not a question of being blessed to know him, but rather, can we honor his legacy, further his epic poem, by working together in community to bring healing to the souls of our time? This task, I promise, will not have the abrupt, shocking, heart-rending end that marked David's profound earthly life. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, John, so much. <clears throat> Cynthia, did you want to begin his early biography? <laughs> I second your thanks to John, eloquently composed and really brought David into the room with us. Thank you so much, John. Yeah, we're going to take our first look at David's life, getting him up to around 1980. So he was born on August 19th, 1947. And as he used to say, what a fabulous time to be born and connected himself at the meteor showers and with the mysteries of the sky, the summer sky. And he had one sister, Janie, who has been close to him over the years and he cultivated that relationship very, um, very deeply. And he grew up in DC and I think we're going to just jump there and let Lisa pick up the last thread that we've been able to find of him so far, which was written by an old friend of his, David Ross. And David got, um, uh, David Ross got David Gershon out to Los Angeles sometime in the late 80s, it looks like. So Lisa, can you, are you able to set up your screen share? Yes. Uh, yes, I'm working on that. Here we go. And I want to set up this share and hold on. Wait, 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 let me do that one more time. See. Here we go. So there is a young David <laughs> and um, it's very exciting to, um, to let everyone know David Ross, uh, this comes from a new website that David Ross set up, which is davidgershon.com. And everyone is welcome to go and post things so and invited to download pictures. So what I've done is I've extracted a few um, uh, episodes that people have shared. And, um, and I will just start by saying that um, when, I, when I brought David about four or five years ago to meet my younger sister as she was about to cross the threshold, the two of them in their upon the threshold uh, conversation discovered that probably David and my older sister met in College Park. And as 
they brought my older sister into the conversation as she was there and decided that they were sure that the two of them were protesting on the streets of College Park in the night, late 1960s. So I'll read now an excerpt from David Ross <clears throat> uh, upon meeting. Uh, within months, David and Janie had come to stay at our new commune near Ithaca, New York. After they completed some school obligations in Maryland, we were all living in Ithaca. Janie started the Leather Guild with Larry, and David opened the Every Man Book and Record Exchange. After knowing David a few months, I brought him to Los Angeles to show him off to my hometown friends. Well, he fused with the only other person I knew with David's abilities, Bruce Markhart, and was immediately adopted by our entire tribe. Cynthia, take it away. <laughs> All right. Um, so David had studied literature and anthropo anthropology at the University of Maryland. And that was before he got out to Los Angeles. And he spent many years there. And where I can pick up the story, and I know there's at least one other person here on the call who was part of that story, who um, he lived in a commune or a hippie community with Bruce Marquardt and um, Mark McKibben, who, as many of you know, is the founder and director of Uriel Pharmacy. And the th three of them had a fabulous living community together. And they came, as far as I understand, they came to Anthroposophy together in that time. And David loved to tell me anecdotes about how Renee and Merlin Carrido and others would come down to his, their place in Los Angeles and do study groups and presentations together. And Rosemary, if you're here and would like to say something, Rosemary tells me that she knew him from that time when she was with Mark. So Rosemary, do you have any, anything to offer? Let's see if we can get Rosemary up here. She might choose not to. Yeah. yeah. Um, there you are. Here I am. You can hear me? Yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> I don't know what else to say. You know, I, I was there for a little bit and then uh, moved away. But uh, David had been a wedding witness for Mark and me at the Christian community. And we were married in 1979. So he had been there before that. And were you part of this little community that David was part of? Only for a little bit. Okay. Um, yeah, a couple months maybe. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. but people, yeah, did come through and speak. And I don't recall that I saw Renee there. Yeah. <laughs> and um, what am I thinking? So we got married 79. So I... I would have lived there in 78. So, right. and, and David was there already. So if that date gives you any help. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. But it's fun. I didn't know, I don't think I know David Ross. I, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thanks, Rosemary. Yes. And during that time, as I understand, David Gershon was doing a lot of cooking. He became a professional chef. Many of you know that he went on to, in the Bay Area to be a chef at Chez Panis and other great restaurants. So he was a consummate chef. But he tells me, told me that he and Mark together decided that this life of hippie anthroposophists in Los Angeles had come to an end and they both wanted to take up a new profession. So the two of them together, he says, decided to start medicine and they enrolled in pre-med school. And at least uh, David chose to go to UC Berkeley for his pre-med classes. And he said soon afterwards, Mark decided he didn't want to do the work with the patients. He would rather do the pharmaceutical work. So they split ways at that time. But as we know, their colleagueship and friendship has lasted an entire lifetime. 
So David, as an older student, went to UC Berkeley for med classes, and then he went to New York, the St. George's University School of Medicine, to get his medical degree. And then he did some of that time in England. And then when he did his internship, he did that at family practices in New Jersey. And then he did his residency at the University of California, Irvine. So that brings him back then in the 90s to California. And after that, he moved to the Bay Area and there he started as a family and HIV primary care specialist in Northern California. And he did that for over two decades. And to hear his idealism and his social awareness is stunning. He was, he, although he already had begun his work as an anthroposophist, he did not go immediately into the anthroposophical stream, that strict stream, but he really worked with street medicine, as many of you know. He started at a community clinic in Redwood City and became increasingly active doing volunteer work with the homeless people. So he was really shedding any kind of personal privilege and felt that his medical work was to, to serve the world. And of course, he was quite interested in helping the HIV populations and um, in the 90s where that crisis was just at its most intense. He also helped develop county-wide prototypes for dealing with STDs and HIV. And uh, his work has found its way into government protocols. He became the medical director for the San Mateo County Mobile Clinics. And then a little footnote, he served as a civil surgeon for the US immigration medical exams. So when someone from out of the country wanted to become you know, or needed medical exams, he was, he was working on that. Perhaps you also know that he became active. He had privileges and worked, I think he was a department head, the University of Santa California, San Francisco Hospital. And he did lecturing there and at Stanford. So that takes us up. I, with that, I want to get us as far as, you know, just before he starts to become more active in anthroposophical medicine. And I wonder if anyone else knows him from that phase when he was so active in street medicine in the HIV clinics. Is there anyone who had, can bring pictures and anecdotes from that time? Yeah. And who is this? This is Ran. Miyashiro? Yes, uh, I worked at San Mateo County Health as an IT uh, projects manager for health and uh, medicine. So I'd actually finished setting up the lab and they introduced me to this director of mobile health clinics. And he wanted to link our computer systems out to where the clinics were so they could uh, treat people on the street and link their records. He struck me as really one of the most enthusiastic and uh, intriguing doctors I ever worked with. And uh, I worked with him for a few years and then I kind of lost touch and I, I wondered what happened to him uh, until I, I read the obituary in the Chronicle. But he, uh, he was really somebody who was living every minute, whether he was at work or home. Thank you so much. I, we really wanted to see if there was anyone who was there from from that time. Is there anyone else who also knows him from that time? Very valuable to hear that. I'm not seeing any hands up. Okay, so I will um, share a little bit from Michael Greenberg and I'm gonna go ahead and put a, a, another photo up of David, if you all can see that um, there. And uh, this is uh, from Michael Greenberg, and then I'll jump over to uh, where this picture is actually from. And, and uh, Lisa, the picture I don't think is coming through, not on my it's oh, okay. screen sharing, but not the picture itself. Okay, and sharing is paused. Let's see. All right, screen share. Let's see, wanted to get. 
this picture. How's that? Did that happen? Yet. Not for me, anyhow. If anyone else has it, please interrupt. But I do. Okay. Well, we're going to set that aside then and okay. move on. And, um, and let me just admit somebody here. And so from Michael Greenberg, um, this is an excerpt from the davidgershen.com site. <clears throat> I first met David when he was working at Fair Oaks Family Health Center in Redwood City, and I started moonlighting as a pediatric resident in the clinic. Here I was, a young upstart, learning the ropes at the clinic in Little Michoacan in Redwood City, California, when, at the lunch break, in walks this fellow with a bag of produce in his East Coast Jewish accent, declares to all who were present, Oh my God, darling, you have to taste this melon. It's glorious. <laughs> and I thought to myself, who is this guy? And from that point on, it was a deep and long lasting friendship. After he bought his flat on Baker Street, he introduced me to his friend and realtor and we became neighbors. David would often call me after work and say, what do you have in your refrigerator? I have a half a butternut squash, three chives, and three capers. I would let him know what I had, and he'd say, okay, I'm coming over, and hang up. And we'd then proceed to make some of the best meals that you can imagine, along with lots of laughs. That's from David Greenberg. And then um, I... I think this was the 90s, so I'll go ahead and read this too. And this is again from David Ross, who created that site. Um, and, uh, and he says that in 1998, he got married for the first time at the age of 48 to Shabnam Shademan. And David was his best man. And he gave a toast soaked in his profound understanding of human nature, spiced with esoteric anthroposophic references, and scared the hell out of all the toasters who followed. <laughs> Whenever we spoke on the phone, David's identity was Dr. Gerkelheimer, whose interest in my prostate was the only thing bigger than my prostate. <laughs> So there is on that website, you can actually hear a quick little voicemail that is posted uh, that David left for him as Dr. Gerkelmeyer. <laughs> Cynthia, oh, Karen, Karen has her hand up. So maybe Karen would like to share. Yeah. I just want to say I met David in 1974 when he was working at Chez Panisse. And my dear friend, and those of you remember Leslie Rosenberg, who founded the Waldorf School, Marin Waldorf. And he came and he was totally present to him, to her during her last illness, bringing the food, all of those things. They do hear about David. Um, he was already doing that when I met him in 1974. And when he decided to become a doctor, we became friends. And when he decided to be a doctor, he said, I'll go anywhere. I will do anything to get that medical, medical degree. And he went to St. George, which I understand was in the Caribbean. Mm -hmm. Maybe they had some kind of liaison with New York City, but I know that he went to the Caribbean, uh, one of the islands there for his medical training. And uh, for myself, um, I feel that I have to take the torch from him because there were things that we were not able to complete in our, our friendship in our lifetime, basically because of me. And uh, yeah, so I feel very much that feeling of Passing the torch, I he passed the torch to me. Thank you so much, Karen. I think that many of us will find that we've got David working through us. So thank you, thank you so much. Um, and you also helped to solve a little mystery when he 
said that he went to St. George. I found two campuses for St. George and one of them's in the Caribbean. So I suppose he went there, but also he himself wrote in his own LinkedIn biography that he graduated from St. George in New York. So probably both things are true. All right. Why, why he could be uh, certified in this country for his medical studies in the Caribbean. They yeah. Yeah. It was an affiliated school at Granada. Thank you so much, Karen. So let's move on now to the next significant chapter where David was working in, um, began to work in anthroposophical medicine. And at this point, I would like to invite Adam Blanning to start things off for us. Everyone. So, there you are. Yeah. See if I can get to you. Yep. Yeah, we can spotlight you. Okay. As soon as I can get there, you are. So beautiful to, to hear these stories about David. There are other doctors on this as well who worked closely with him and know him very well. I can say the last um, 15, 18 years, David was very busy organizationally. He was very busy teaching. He was very busy collaborating. I, I learned the idea that people come into groups for different reasons. Um, some people come because they really like the information and they want to think together. And some people come to a group because they want to start a new impulse. And some people come because they want to be with other people. And David was able to think well, and he was able to initiate things, but it was clear that his love of being with other people was profound and wide ranging. He loved to find ways that he could connect with individual people. Um, I've heard lots of different things where it's not quite an inside joke, but it's an inside connection or an inside insight. I think he cultivated those in really beautiful ways. I will say when David was teaching, um, you had to be quick on your feet because there's a mercurial aspect where he would be teaching something incredibly profound and then saying um, not quite a, well, sometimes an ironic comment, sometimes an anecdote, but uh, always breathing between deep insight and then also something that was very much an expression of his personality and his joy and his humor. Um, the things that stick out to me very strongly is doing the doctor's trainings and sitting together with him in the evenings where sometimes people were quite tired and he would have a commentary about what was going on, which was both profound appreciation for what was happening, but could also then be a passion comment about the speaker who was on stage and um, how did those shoes feel or something like that, <laughs> um, which, which was always beautiful in terms of the warmth of humanity and connection. And when Cynthia mentioned that it feels like David's work is not be finished in this lifetime. Uh, it's been striking to hear how many people he was reaching out to and speaking with in profound ways and making plans for the future just in the days and weeks before he passed. Um, not, not like he was saying goodbye to people, but that he was really initiating and deepening things. So he's been a, a joyful presence and doesn't let you get away with too many things and also a very generous contributor and teacher in the medical work. He served for a long time on the PAM board and it's been mentioned that he was also a liaison from the medical work to the Council for Anthroposophic Organizations. I thought he was very busy and it, it seems that he was just busy in all kinds of circles and organizations that were parallel. Thank, Thank you, you, Adam. What a wonderful contribution. Thank you. 
I think we're going to open open up the um, the field for more contributions at this point. I'd like to just contribute one thing as a as a therapist who worked in frequent collaboration with him. He was always emphasizing that every relationship from physician or therapist to patient was a karmic connection. And he really took these, the, that part of the work so very seriously. He, he always held that up. A patient would go to him and say, you know, this is karma that we're starting on together. So, so um, I, perhaps if you were his patient, you're still gonna feel yourself carried by him until you get yourself onto someone else. Yeah, I would, um, I'd oh. love to invite Robert McDermott to sh share. Robert, would you yes, like to? I'm, I'm coming. <laughs> yes, thank you for this opportunity. Thank you all who have spoken, especially the amazing first contribution by, uh, by John, which is I thought was very deep and memorable. Well, this is something that I wrote almost within hours of hearing that David had passed, so it still has that feel of shock and sadness. Um, dear David, since yesterday, since yesterday afternoon, Ellen and I have thought only of you, our dear friend and doctor. We are in shock and not okay. David, you just almost fixed your apartment ready for your patients. Good that Ellen helped you send the remedies from Oriel. You would have been too busy cooking and baking to have done it yourself. She should have got you to clear the piles of books, one of them being my copy of Rick Tornis' Cosmos and Psyche, off your dining room table. Since yesterday, since the call from Laura to Liz to us, Ellen has repeated, we didn't have a chance to say goodbye. You and Ellen had a connection. Was it her kindness and yours, or was it your home-baked bagels? You brought the wrong one of us to the Saigon sandwich shop, that hole in the wall in the Tenderloin. I love that you read Joyce in high school and again at Cornell. I said, David, you're so smart, smart, smart. Still from Baltimore, you said, yeah, like that. <laughs> And more than that, more than smart, so kind. 30 years with AIDS patients and so many others. Your many patients need you still. What will they do? What will Ellen and I do? And your sister whom you love and your favorite Eurythmus, Maria and Cynthia and the BD Association, your dear friend, Philip, is still on his way slowly. If I were God, I would have let Philip go and keep you here to do all that, uh, all, all that you have to give, the time for research, for your patience, for your cello, for your compassion, for your friendships. I wanted you to meet and, and surely like my Stanford brother, like you, a Joycean, smart, kind, and anti-fancy. I wanted a few, few, no, more, many more coffees with you at the de Young. Ellen and I will track you. Please pay attention. We still need you and love you. So thank you. Thank you, Robert. Thank you. Beautifully done. Beautifully done. I think that might have been might be mirrored in many of us who said to ourselves, David, that was premature, wasn't it? <laughs> Why did you think of leaving? Oh, we're not ready for you to go. Yes. So yes, we welcome um, anyone who'd like to, uh, to speak is welcome to on under reactions on the bottom of your uh, screen, there is a lower bar that allows you to raise your hand, you could do that. You also could flash uh, your hand in the screen 
um, if you want or just jump in anyone who would like to share a thought Linda thank you for Lisa and Cynthia for doing this um, I was a patient for four years right and but really David was more of a friend than even than a doctor. So I'm still in shock. I'm still in denial. But one curious thing I wanted to bring to this group because I thought maybe someone would know. It was a mystery. When I first started working with him, I asked him what I should call him. Dr. David, Dr. Gershon, David? And it was a true question on my part. And he gave me a comparably true answer. He said, would you be willing to call me Dr. Raul? <laughs> I said, I will call you whatever you want. And apparently he had had some interaction with a waitress at a local whatever place. And he went up to the waitress and ordered something. And she said, well, what's your name? And he said, Raul. And she looked at him kind of, okay. And then when it was his turn to get the food, she called him up saying, Raulito. And obviously, so he ended up on good terms with her and all. But I wondered why would he want me to call him Raul? And I asked him later, uh, because that stayed until he's still Dr. Raul to me. Um, but he wanted to get every inch of blessing out of that name. So he wanted R, not R-A-U-L, he wanted R-A-O-U-L when I would email him back and forth. Thank you. So, does anyone have any insight on why he would ask for that? I'll match you on that one. It's just that he loved to play names. He loved to play names, and I don't know how many of us he had pet names for, but this was totally on his own. One day when he called me, he said, Natasha, Natasha, this is Boris, and they just let me out of the prison, and I don't know how I'm going to get to see you again, but we'll work it out. And ever he did from Rocky and Bullwinkle. And every time he called me since then, I was his Natasha and he was his Boris and I don't know why, but he loved alter egos and replacement personalities. Just say it. Thank you, Cynthia. Yeah. I think I also want to say that his courage really impressed me because in February of 2019, I came down with something that might've been COVID, but we didn't think it was at the time, but I was out of work for three weeks. And toward, you know, somewhere in the middle of that, he said, well, can you get up here so I can see you and really diagnose what's going on? Well, yeah, I could probably, you know, it's an hour away by driving, but I thought I was well enough to do it. And it just felt so courageous because we didn't know very much at all about COVID at that time. It was very early on. And I thanked him for that. And he said, well, that's what we do. That's what doctors do. Thank you. All right, Lisa, we have some hands up. Can you see them? Yes, I, I uh, see Karen is has her hand up. So Karen, if you want to go ahead and unmute. I'm thinking about Raul and given David's social values and the fact that he took his medical degree in the Caribbean, I'm thinking about Raul Castro. Okay. <laughs> the fact that in Cuba, they have more doctors per person than any other country. Okay, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> maybe it's only a maybe. <laughs> Yeah. Well, I was, uh, David knew Mala Powers. I don't know who else here knew Mala Powers. She was a, an amazing anthroposophist and was the uh, beautiful Roxanne to Jose Ferrer Cyrano and the uh, 
executor of the Chekhov estate. Uh, but the fact that David and I both knew Mala, we had many, many conversations about uh, various, uh, you know, various film characters. And he was often doing sort of Betty Davis and that sort of, that sort of thing with, with his calls to me. Uh, Rosita. Oh. Rosita and Jeff. Oh, and Jeff. Okay, yeah. Yeah, with me. I, I don't know how to get my, oh, can you see me then? We, need we to can. Yeah. yeah, okay, okay. One moment, so I, one I, moment. You are unmuted. I may have a clue on Raul. Uh, I also read James Joyce when I was in uh, college. And somewhere in Ulysses, I remember some crazy humorous passage in, 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 in which Molly, is that her name? Molly Bloom? There was some line, at some point she said, at the end of some soliloquy, she said, for him, for Raul. And it was some kind of fantasy she had, I think. Somebody may correct me, but that may be where Raul came from, because Ra Raul was a, a romantic figure to Molly Bloom, I believe, in, in Ulysses by James Joyce. <laughs> Thank you. Thank Did you. you have anything else to bring Jeff to? Um, yes, 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 yes. We had a wonderful conversation with David the day before he died. And, uh, you know, uh, I, I, I felt like I was getting closer to David as, as time went on. And uh, I said this the last time that uh, as a nurse, I never felt that I had my doctor, my own doctor, you know, like a, like a, 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 a husband might have a wife, a nurse would, could have a doctor. And at the end, I was thinking, just then I was thinking, you know, David just might be my doctor, you know, and I was feeling very warm towards him. And so was Rose Feet. We had, both of us, we had uh, lovely conversations with him just that day. And I'd also like to, uh, to, to, um, to share that uh, David never treated me until, as a doctor until right at the very end, maybe a month ago. And um, I was having some difficulty sleeping. And, you know, I was also talking about some issues, you know, about uh, getting myself to do things that I really intended to do. And he gave me a remedy of ferrum on my spleen this is bringing Mars into the Saturn field. And he also gave me two phosphorus remedies, a, a D6 and a D30 for sleep. The phosphorus in the morning to wake me up and the, uh, um, the phosphorus in, at night, D30, the higher potency, to help me you know, exit for the night. And by golly, he hit the bullseye with both of them. So I got to give it to him posthumously good work david and um yeah i was very appreciative of all of that all of those experiences at the end and we were also very you know sad to uh to 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 have him leave but um we have also had a theme in our lives rosvita and i um of uh people dying close to us and we're just in the movement towards having a closer relationship with those who had, who had died. And we had just been thinking about beginning to read um, the uh, life between death and a new birth and rebirth. And uh, that sort of clinched it. You know, we were just about to start. We had read the other couple of uh, lectures on that subject. And, uh, and sort of David just anchored that for us. That that's what Thanks. we're gonna do. Yeah, yeah. He, okay. he, he blew the door wide open for us. It was quite amazing. Yeah. And uh, in the last few weeks of his life, he was very busy with the, um, the Michael and the Soul Forces, the four lectures. And, and he, uh, every time he talked to us, and we talked very often in the last few weeks, he, he said, like, have you, have you read it? You know, the, the Gemüt. And then he talked to me in German. <laughs> He just liked to play. He was such an incredible play mouse, yeah. And um, and then Jeff and I, we read it. I said, you know, David is getting on, on our case. We have to reread that and we have to talk to him about it, which we did. So he got us to to uh, to do all the lectures and then we emailed back and forth and 
yeah, it was just, you know, he's just an incredible being, incredible, generous heart and incredible, generous soul and funny and um, abrupt. You know, he had such a, a soul spectrum, David. I, I think I don't think there was any feeling in his soul that he couldn't feel into. Uh, it's, and I miss him dearly, dearly. When I first heard about it, I said, you know, David, this is no joke. I'm going to call you up right now and I will tell you what bad joke that is. That's how I felt about it. Yeah. And I, I just felt like I was being boxed in my solar system. Yeah, I could not, I could not believe it that he just, uh, he just uh, went like this. But, you know, and, and many people, I think he did that too. You had like a conversation and you talked about something and then he said, gotta go, gotta go. And, and Jeff reminded me of that. You know, that was also a gesture of David. Gotta go. Yeah. Gotta Thank go. you so much. And, and he went. You know, we're going to try to give a lot of people a chance to do three-minute yes, presentations. Yes, I'm, done. I'm done. Thank you for listening. Thank you so much. <laughs> Patricia Reber. Hi. There you a are. Colleague and a... Uh, uh, he was a friend and uh, yeah, I, miss, I miss him dearly. Um, anyway, I was thinking about um, this depth of soul that he had, that he could see not only who you were, but he kind of go, went in so deeply. And we had that kind of relationship where <laughs> sometimes he'd be talking to me about whatever was going on in his life and I would say, a question and he gets so mad at me he would just like stop talking to me and then he would turn around and he'd go you know you're right and he did that to me too there was one time where we were putting on a conference together and he um he was really pissed off and I was like hiding behind my friend going don't I'm not going to go out there yet. I'm not going to go out there yet. I'm not going to go out there. Can I wait for you? And she goes, no, it's okay. Just go. And I trepidly just walked out the door and he was out there with another colleague. There were four of us that put on the conference together and I knew I was going to get hit and he blasted me and I turned around and was going to walk away. And he said, what are you going to do? Turn around, walk away, or turn around and start crying and walk away. And I was, I turned on a dime and I went after him. <laughs> and this is the kind of relationship we had. We were able to like duke it out. And he had so much respect for me after that. And we just kind of got deeper and deeper and deeper. And we would call each other and I would call him Mr. Gershon. And, and my kids would laugh every time I would say that. And he goes, you know, you're the only person that's ever called me Mr. Gershon. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Who else? Uh... Did I see you, Cynthia? No, maybe not Cynthia Weber. Oh. Are you raising your hand? Oh, you're muted, so I don't know if you did. You can unmute if you want. There you Maybe go. Maybe later. <laughs> okay. Okay. Now, there is a verse in the uh, soul calendar, which I thought would be perfect, so perhaps a little bit later. Okay. Is there anyone else who has thoughts or like to share? Yeah, I would like to. Oh, hey. Yeah, hi. Thank you everyone who's been speaking and saying such wonderful things about David. Um, one of the things, of course, that is very obvious, I probably to most of us, how he really enjoyed and loved Eurythmy and uh, valued it very much in the medical sphere. So I just wanted to mention that um, also for the, a lot of the anthroposophical um, organized meetings that we had here over the last several years, um, he always wanted 
to have something of Eurythmy as part of those events. Um, there was also one other aspect I wanted to mention. Um, since there was a question shortly after he died of why he died or how he died, and I just found out recently that it actually was um, a heart attack that when, when the um, autopsy finally was revealed to his sister, she has mentioned the fact that it was a heart attack and it had nothing to do with this COVID booster that, um, that some people heard about. Just wanted to say that as well. Thank you, Dale. Thank you. And Harold? Yes. So when I heard the news in one day, maybe three times, when I talked about David and people were saying, well, you know, he took the booster. Yeah, yeah. Kind of like too bad that she did this. I uh, wanted to investigate and ask different people. And it took a while until I, I finally uh, found it. Um, actually, through uh, Jeff uh, Salmon, who had talked with Jamie, his sister. And Jamie, uh, uh, Jamie then looked um, through his papers and she found the little card, the um, vaccination card. And on there, he only had the two shots, but not no, no booster was on there. And normally had he had the booster, it should have gotten into the card. So I felt it was important that um, it didn't become sort of a politicized matter again. Why did, why did David do this? Right. I knew that he had different, that he had on the one hand, strong uh, feeling that he wouldn't want to do it. He said, it makes no sense. On the other hand, it was clear too that he wouldn't be able to see his patients in the UC system uh, or some of his patients. And so he was, he had a split uh, sense there. Um, it was difficult for him to, um, I think, to decide. But it seems that he didn't um, really, that he didn't get the, uh, the, sh the booster. And it's important too for people to uh, make sure that everybody knows and that this doesn't keep going around. Maybe you'd also like to talk about its relationship to biodynamics. Yes. So David, of course, we, we've met here on campus uh, at the, uh, when we had Rudolf Steiner College here. And so we started talking. We, there were plant observations that he did. And so I, I got closer to him in the last few years. And um, he wanted to do more work with me. Also, he wanted to do then a actually a, a, a webinar for the for the branch for this uh, Santa Cruz branch, which then finally I did with with Patricia Reber. But he always had these ideas, and he had very good thoughts, kind of combining the different fields. So anthroposophic medicine from his perspective, and then what, how we use the plants in biodynamic agriculture. So it was a very fruitful relationship. But I also met then David in his ways uh, that sometimes he could, he could be a little opinionated, could get strong, have strong uh, opinion, and yet you know, this desire actually also to be with other people very strongly, being all the way there and got to go, got to go. <laughs> <laughs> it's typical on the phone, sort of these conversations when you would say this. <laughs> and, uh, but then when you say another sentence and then suddenly he's in for another five, five minutes or so <laughs> because it's just so good and you wouldn't want to miss it. <laughs> so I definitely miss him. And at the end, he also wanted to just take me on as a patient. He just said, OK, let, let's start working. And yeah, he left. He left. He left holes. He left holes, definitely, yeah. I see, I see another hand up and that's um, Monash. I don't know if that's Glenda or David Michael. So um, we, if we can get to you and you can unmute yourselves or we can do that for you. Well, I'm here. It's Thank me, it's you. David Michael. Hi, Cynthia. Hello there, David Michael. Hello everybody who I haven't <laughs> seen for a long, long time. And I don't like to have my face on this Zoom calls. So that's why I've only got my voice going, which I know is also a bit problematic. 
I've been quite ill lately. Sorry to hear it. So um, I just wanted to say that David came into my life fairly recently. He and, my, and Glenda, my dear wife, had been working together a lot with Philip and Kao down in Creston. And I was also teaching a group of people that didn't include David, but I met him at some point. And I almost sent a photograph that I had taken a selfie of the two of us on his little porch in his house in San Francisco when I went there for lunch one day. But he, even though we hardly knew one another, he somehow took a great interest in me and suggested some things to help with my healing. And he recommended some medications. And Glenda has called at the Valet and spoken with Petra, whom some of you I'm sure know. And she said that Petra said, don't worry, we'll continue doing the refills even though he's passed on. Because he had ordered certain rec medications for me that were based on a recipe of Rudolf Steiner's, an original recipe that the Valeda no longer normally makes. And they made some and I'm taking them daily. So I was incredibly moved that he was as moved by our meeting as I had been. So that's all I wanted to say is that he was everything that I've heard described from the number of people. I came in a few moments late, but I caught the end of John's excellent presentation. And thank you so much. And I was wondering is it Rachel who's on the community share? You had such a reaction. You were laughing so hard when something was said about Raul. And I wondered if you would share what that was about because it was obviously something that meant a lot to you. Uh, so it's Lisa Dalton. Lisa, okay. Yes, and, uh, and I think my reaction is because it, it he was always with me. He was always a different, uh, a different persona, uh, usually from a film, because of our uh, our shared affinity for theatrical three theatricality. And uh, Raoul was. It just struck me as really, really funny. And uh, and I love the idea that it's a sort of Joycey and potential um, inspiration. <laughs> yeah. David to me was always so. Um, mercurial in jumping from the absolutely absurdly witty um, theatrics to a very deep uh, point that needed to be made. And um, yeah, so I'm, I feel like I'm bouncing back and forth between those two experiences today. Thank you. I see Ken Simpson has his hand up. Ken, did you want to share? Yes, uh, thank you, Lisa. Uh, I became aware of David through the Bay Area and beyond uh, uh, group. And uh, in the latter year, I started sending him uh, emails on uh, classical music, such as Bach track and gramophone. And instantly, it's like this relationship just blossomed with this beauty, he had such, such a sense of love of classical music like I've never seen. And back and forth, here we are sharing emails about this piece of music, that piece of music. And this was a love of David's heart. I just thought I wanted to share that. Oh, you know. okay. Thank you, Ken. Uh, and then we had Dean Fairbanks too. Yes, I accidentally lowered uh, his hand when I was meant to lower Ken's and it jumped on me. So Dean. <laughs> if you're talking, Dean, we can't hear you yet. Hear me? Now yes. we can, yes? No. Oh, hold on, you're oh, there you are. So. Nope. <laughs> yeah, I, I've got you, Dean. Well, you're muted again, but it doesn't say you are. Uh, 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 does that work? Yes. That's it. Okay, wonderful. Okay. 
I just want to back onto what Harold had to say, and I, I'm coming at it from the uh, the biodynamic community. I met uh, David through actually through my wife Portia uh, back in 2016, and I was on the uh, the biodynamic uh, BDNC uh, committee. And my wife had said, you know, I want I met this wonderful doctor named uh, David Gershon at the PAM meeting at the Ion Center in 2016 in August. And she goes, you know, I heard you guys were going to do um, starting for the 2017 theme for BDANK uh, on health and in agriculture. He would be a wonderful speaker. And I cold called David out of nowhere. He didn't know me. And we've started this relationship over the years that was, was this wonderful. And he, he gladly came and talked at our winter meeting. Um, and I just want to say that, that he was, he was really, as Harold said, he really got into biodynamics and he really was, he felt that it was the way forward with health. And he was so giving as an individual. And, and I, I used to enjoy at the university, I would get these cold calls from out of, out of nowhere in my office Dean, this is David Gershon, and I, I, I got to talk to you right now. We need to get more. Um, at the time, he was we were he was trying to get me to get a graduate student to work on, um, um, oh gosh, a mistletoe, and and mapping mistletoe throughout Sonoma County. We've got to get this done, and he always had these projects. So I go, okay, David, I will help you. <laughs> I will help you as much as I can, and even uh, through COVID. I was still getting, uh, he, he cold called me, I wanna say in, in, all of a sudden I got this call and like, I think it was like October of just this last year. Dean, I'm redoing the Bay Area website. It's a disaster, I need your help. And you know, I, I said, David, I will try to help you. <laughs> it's somebody you always wanted to help, you wanted to work with because he was so enthusiastic. And boy, he was after me for the last couple of years. Dean, why have you not joined the first class? What, what do you, why have you not joined the first class? I'm like, David. <laughs> I'm like, well, <laughs> he's probably still saying that. But this was a, he was just a wonderful individual to the, to the biodynamic community, the farmers, uh, the nurses, he got uh, folks involved. And I, I think some of the most fondest times I had is when he got together with Cynthia and they would do these wonderful Eurythmy and, and um, biodynamic uh, uh, doctor presentations at the BDANK winter meetings, and they were so well attended. And uh, I, I really do miss him. I, I, when, I, when I heard uh, the day after he had passed, I, I was just so shocked because I, you know, you, you get these calls from him and you're ready to work with him. And then all, I don't know, it's so, David, we love you, namaste. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dean. Sally, Sally Greenberg. Hi, thank you so much for doing this. It's been wonderful to hear all these stories as well. And I'm nervous. I didn't expect to speak, but I feel it's important. Um, I met David through Maria Helen Hansen, who uh, was doing therapy, therapeutic eurythmy with my daughter, who was six, I think, at the time, who has um, many uh, developmental difficulties and health challenges. And she introduced me to David so reluctantly with so many um, disclaimers. <laughs> uh, and I was so fortunate to have that experience of them meeting in his house. And my daughter wrote on his calendar of the soul because that's how precocious she was at the time. And he didn't let her get away with pretending she didn't do it, which I loved. And he's treated her for the last seven years and um, been such a good friend and doctor. And it amazed me at the end of his life when um, Stephen Decatur died, uh, how he was there for them. And he drove all those hours out to the farm. Um, it impressed me so much in a way that I hadn't known him. And now that um, I got to see him a few weeks, maybe a month before he passed, and I had such a heart uh, feeling of love when I saw him, I didn't know it was going to be the last time um, in, in, on this plane, um, but I can feel him working within the community and within myself still. And I feel like he's such a good example of how somebody can pour themselves out into the world and then they live on. And I can um, 
I just have so much gratitude for him for teaching me, continuing to teach me, um, even without his, his the body, um, all the lessons that he's been feeding me through the years of knowing him about developing my different bodies. And um, yeah, I, I feel really grateful. And um, thank you for letting me share. Thank you, thank you Sally. Sally. Beautiful yeah. sharing. We have uh, David Michael Monash, whose hand is up. And then I think Cynthia. Yeah. Did, did you have another one, David? Or was that from your first share? Oh, you're muted. I, if you wanted to say something else. There we go. He's done. No, I'm not done. Oh. <laughs> yeah. No. <laughs> He and I got mixed up. Cynthia, oh. can you hear me? Okay. Yes. Uh huh. Okay. Cynthia, go ahead. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. I just wanted to just <laughs> pull a little thread here as we um, um, go on. That um, we had uh, Dale talk about how much David loved working with the um, uh, the Eurythmus. And Harold said how much he really loved working with the biodynamics. And we know how much he loved working with the pharmacy work. He just really wanted to create mistletoe. And then Sally mentioned um, when Steve Decatur died and how he showed up for that. And uh, at that point, David said, there's nothing that's more important than the pastoral medicine and working together with a priest. And so we're tracking this, his great love and his commitment to working with so many different people and different initiatives. And he was looking for a totality of collaboration. And maybe as we come into our last minutes now, maybe Lisa, you can start off, but a few people might want, and Cynthia Weber's got something here too. But you yeah. might want to, to, the thread I'd like to pull at is his deep passion here at the end towards um, working for the good of the anthroposophical movement altogether and with the initiatives that he was taking in the Bay Area in that direction. That ties all of us together. Yes, I, I would love to speak about that. Um, I recently helped form uh, the Matreya branch in North Texas. And as I mentioned earlier, some of you might not have been on, but David brought me in to help him with the technology of the Zoom meetings that he began during the pandemic. And it we so we had many lengthy discussions about his aims in uh, with these uh, meetings. It was a deep, deep dream of his to build a stronger Bay Area community that would evolve into a branch. And I had many opinions about how this can form and, and what needs to happen for a branch to manifest itself. And we spoke about the idea that the branch is its own being and it's a being that has some different kind of will to incarnate that is unique from a group. And what is that? And who is it that can carry that? And what is the, the will for that? And, um, and I have, I, he, he had this longing and I hope this longing is streaming forward um, in, in all of you that are in the Bay Area. It's a very exciting that we will have a March 6th in-person celebration at the San Francisco Waldorf School. Um, and I, I know I myself have been to events there of the Bay Area Anthroposophical Group. Um, but wherever the physical plant might wind up being of this being, if it incarnates, the will um, for, for this group to transform, evolve, or incarnate in some fashion um, must be among those who are there. And um, through the process of tuning into this and maybe maybe David is a tuning fork for this uh, spirit uh, to help um, if it is to be so 
it is uh, uh, I'm looking at Stephen Johnson uh, words that he was talking about also from the davidgershon.com website which again I support you all to to post and share um, that he was always looking continuing to look for more therapeutic insights and um, that he was there was always a kind of obvious enthusiasm in when he contemplated uh, new ideas and when he for example in anthroposophic medicine when he recently talked about uh, cardiodoron as a heart medicine uh, that uh, he wanted to use it in new ways uh, preventative and salutogenic ways um, for many of the stressors of our modern times uh, that our times are placing upon patients and he was always suffering from uh, the suffering of the area. And what I'd like to suggest is that because David sought to heal and bring healing, and he was always continuously seeking therapeutic means, that somehow the forming of a Bay Area branch would be a therapeutic uh, experience, or could be, or might be an extension of his own anthroposophical medicine for the social art. We know that uh, Dr. Steiner spoke of finding the ability for small groups to work together in harmony and peace uh, to be of great, great importance for our evolution because if we cannot create harmony, peace, and productivity in a small group, how can we ever bring that out to the world? So I just offer that as a, a thought for you all. And um, yeah, yeah. So beautiful. So we have nine minutes left, and we're going to take a couple minutes at the end to close the space. So we have uh, two more people with their hands up, Cynthia Weber, and then David Michael is, is here also. But uh, Cynthia Weber? Yes, you, uh, okay. Can you hear me? Yes, we yes. can. Okay. Um, thank you, everybody. It's been fantastic. And I've learned so much. Although I've known David for years, I've really mm -hmm. learned a lot about his life. So I certainly appreciate everything. I wanted to mention this soul calendar verse because David always closed our Bay Area meeting with something from the soul calendar. And this I feel exemplifies David. It's from January 12th, the 40, 41st verse. The soul's creative might strives outward from the heart's own core to kindle and inflame, <clears throat> excuse me, God-given powers in human life to right activity. The soul thus shapes itself in human loving and in human working. And that was David. <laughs> so much. Indeed. And I just want to add, this is David Michael again, what I was trying to say before, and I don't know what happened with that muting and unmuting, Cynthia, but it was a mess. Anyway, I, I'm on, I think I'm on now. And I just wanted to add that several people have said, why? Why has he left now? It's not fair. And that's a very earth-centered point of view. Glenda, my wife, and I have spoken numerous times about this. And he's not alone in leaving right now. Sophia Walsh has just left. Margareta Karen's just left. And we said, you know what? The spiritual world must need a lot of help right now. And these people are there to help from the other side. And I definitely feel that is the case with David. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Well, it has been a really, really rich time. Once again, Lisa, Thank you so much for having sparked this initiative. Very wonderful. 
And Lisa reminds us that there is this website that's gone up, davidgershen.com. And I believe that the um, information about the March 6th gathering is on there, isn't it? Or, yeah, davidgershen.com. And in response to people's wishes, I have agreed to um, do the hallelujah with you. It's not a performance event. It's an opportunity for you to unite. As I'm fond of saying when I teach the Eurythmy online, in full cognizance of its limitations, but also aware of its blessings. We're not in simultaneous places or the same place, but we are working in simultaneous time together. And that can break through a lot of barriers. So just a moment, let's stand up if you like, or otherwise just sit and deepen your experience. But I would like even before that, once again, to read the calendar of the soul verse, this time, the one that I wanted to read for him. With you, my, with you, my soul seeks you intuitively. My soul is with you and lives your task with you. Thus, we are united karmically for all time. That's not the count of the soul. No, it doesn't fly. Oh, from the saying connected verses. And those who wish to stand and do this, please do. And or find your own way with this next moment here. Remember, you have the gift that you with me is an activity that inscribes itself into the etheric world, into the ethers. And so with these outwelling movements, we're filling the space that we're living in with a communication and living thought. So very gently and with quiet words, I will guide us through it, just so we can say simultaneously. So I fold my hands to my heart, I stand before the spiritual world. And with that aid, I open myself to the spirit. My hands in awe, I lead the spiritual forces down towards the earth. And with a series of growing elves, the forces of life and light and love grow. And a second L. And a third L. Across the country, we're speaking together. And a fifth L. Six, a seven L. Let it ring around you. And after this cleansing of yourself personally with the A, we stand in acknowledgement of the unseen worlds. And they open to us in the three larger and more profound L's. Cleanse imaginative consciousness. And cleanse inspirational. And the third L, may we see truly in the spirit. With the O, we gather our arms together and lead ourselves rooted to the sky and to the earth. And from the O, we receive the E, the sense of self. With the awe upward raise, we get off of all of our forces back to spirit. In coming age, we stand in reverence in the presence of the creators.
dear friends, thank you for coming together for this afternoon in celebration of David's life and a will to continue his work. Lisa, do you have an, a last word? Just many blessings and great gratitude to you all for joining us and looking forward to supporting however the work can unfold in the future. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Goodbye. Blessings. Blessings. Thank you. We'll post the recording on the website and I'll, we'll share it with some of the emails that went out as well. Thank you. Thank you, Lisa. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Lisa and Cynthia. This was beautiful. Thank you. Thank you.